Well, here's what you guys need to know about the walls of Jericho. They were big. They were immense. They were huge. They wrapped around the city like a suit of armor. Two concentric circles of stone surrounded the city, rising a total of about 40 feet off the ground. Impenetrable. Here's what you need to know about Jericho's inhabitants. They were ferocious. They were barbaric. They withstood all sieges. They repelled all invaders. They were guilty of child sacrifice. Deuteronomy says they even burned their sons and daughters as sacrifices to their gods. They were a Bronze Age version of the Gestapo, ruthless tyrants on the plains of Canaan. Until, until the day Joshua shows up. Until the day his army marched in. Until the day that the bricks cracked and the boulders broke. Until the day everything shook. The stones of the walls, the knees of the king, and the teeth of the soldiers. That immovable fortress met the unstoppable force. And mighty Jericho crumbled. But here's what you need to know about Joshua. And that is that Joshua didn't bring those walls down. Joshua's soldiers never swung a hammer. His men never dislodged a brick. They never rammed a door or pried loose a stone. The shaking, quaking, rumbling, and tumbling of those thick, impervious walls, well, you see, God did that. God did that for them, and God will do that for you. You see, your Jericho is your fear. Your Jericho is your anger, your bitterness, your prejudice, your insecurity about the future, your, your guilt about the past. It's your negativity, it's your self-doubt, it's your anxiety. It's your proclivity to criticize, to overanalyze, to compartmentalize. Your Jericho is any attitude or mindset that keeps you from joy, peace, or rest. Jericho. And you know, just like it did for the ancient Hebrews, Jericho stands between you and your promised land. It mocks you. It tells you that your dreams should take a hike. Go back to the wilderness. It stands like a giant troll on the bridge of progress. It's big, it's evil, it blocks your way, and its walls must come down. See, to live in the promised land, you must face your Jericho. You know, it's not always easy. Every level of inheritance requires the disowning of the devil. Satan must be moved off before the saint can move in. Joshua told his people to go in and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. The very translation of possess means to occupy, to drive out the previous tenants and possess it in their place. Well, how do we relate that to Satan? I'm sure once you gave your heart to Christ, Satan just moved off without a fight, right? He just allowed you to move into those luxurious digs you now call the promised land, right? Wrong. Satan's not leaving without a fight. He will resist. He will push back. But he will not win. Why? Well, because God, in his infinite mercy and wisdom, has already declared that you are the victor. Satan, defanged and defeated at Calvary, has no authority over you. God's word to Joshua is the same as his word to us. Be strong and of good courage, 
Do not heed your fear. Do not cower before your foes. Take the land that God has given you to possess. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You see, Joshua, God didn't say to Joshua, Joshua, take the city. God said, Joshua, I want you to receive the city I've already taken. I've already given it to you. I have already won your battle. So Joshua... He didn't go forth hoping to win. He knew God had already won. And the same can be said about you and whatever challenge you're facing. God doesn't say, Bob, break those bad habits. He says, Bob, I've broken the bad habits of your life and received now the blessing of my victory. Remember, folks, you and I are co-heirs with Christ. Every attribute of Jesus is at our disposal. Was Jesus victorious? Did he overcome sin and death? Will you be victorious? Can you overcome sin and death? Yes, the question isn't, will you overcome? It's, when will you overcome? You see, life always brings us challenges. But God always gives us the strength to face them. You know, things are different in the promised land. Things are different in Canaan. Hang-ups and addiction, they don't have the last word. Today's problem isn't necessarily tomorrow's problem. Don't imprison yourself by assuming it is. Resist self Labeling, oh, I'm just a worrier. Oh, gossip's my weakness. Well, my dad was a drinker and his dad before him, and I guess I'll just carry on that tradition. Stop it. These words that we speak so glibly, so flippantly, they create alliances with Satan. They grant him access to your spirit. It's not God's will that you live life defeated, marginalized, and unhappy. Turn a deaf ear to those old voices and instead make new choices. Psalm 16 says, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. Friends, live out your inheritance, not your circumstance. What do we have to look forward to? The promised land. Who cares if we got to go through 40 years in the wilderness? Come on, folks. What are we going forward? What are we moving toward? God has already promised us victory. He already assured that at the cross. And he's also provided weapons for the fight. I can picture the soldiers... I can picture the soldiers there perking up as Joshua, their commander, announces, all right, folks, the moment that we have waited for has finally arrived. It's time for us to take Jericho. Great, they reply. We've got our ladders. We've got our ropes. We're going to scale the walls. Our spears are sharpened. Our swords are ready. Which side do we attack first, Joshua? Which, what's the plan? Joshua looks at his me and says, well, I like your enthusiasm. But God has a different strategy. And then the general, he begins to outline one of the most unlikely sounding battle strategies ever. He says, what you're going to do is you're going to put the priests in front. Okay. And you're going to let them... Bear seven trumpets of ram's horns, and they will walk before the ark of the Lord. We're following you. And then Joshua commands the soldiers to march in front of and behind the priests. He tells the priests to blow the trumpets continually as they walk around the city once a day. And the rest of the people, it says in verse 10, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout, then you shall shout. Teachers, you might want to write down that verse for later. Wait a minute. 
They're hearing all this and they're saying, no war cries, no hand-to-hand combat, no flashing sword, no flying spears, no battering rams or catapults. What kind of battle strategy is this, Joshua? Priests' horns, marching and silence. Joshua, you've got at least 40,000 soldiers at your command and you're telling us to keep quiet and watch. What kind of warfare is this? Spiritual warfare. Every battle, ultimately, is a spiritual battle. Every conflict that we face is a contest against Satan and his forces. Paul urged us in Ephesians 6, he says, stand against the wiles of the devil. The Greek word for wiles there is methodia, from which we get our word method, right? Satan is not passive. Satan is not fair. He doesn't play by any rules. He is active. He is deceptive. He has designs and strategies. There are methods. There are tactics that he uses. Well, that means that we should have a strategy as well, don't you think? That's why the Bible tells us for that reason, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Where does our strength come from? From God. Where do our victories come from? From God. Just as Jericho was a stronghold in Canaan, we have strongholds in our lives, don't we? The Apostle Paul, he he used that term to describe a mindset or an attitude. The weapons of our warfare are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So the apostle here, he defined a stronghold as an argument or a high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So it's a conviction, it's an outlook, it's a belief that attempts to interfere with the truth. Other translations, they describe a stronghold as imaginations, pretension, lofty opinion, or warped philosophies. You guys see any warped philosophies out there in the world today? I do. A stronghold is a false premise that denies God's promise. It says it sets itself up against the knowledge of God. It seeks to eclipse our discovery of God. It attempts to magnify the problem and minimize God's ability to solve it. So the question that comes to each of us this morning is does a stronghold have a stranglehold on you? Do you see nothing but Jericho and its walls? Do you feel nothing but despair? Do you think thoughts of defeat? Do you speak the language of impossibility? God can never forgive me. That's the stronghold of guilt. Well, I could never forgive that person. Well, that's the stronghold of resentment. Well, bad things just always seem to happen to me. That's the stronghold of self-pity. Well, I have to be in charge. That's the stronghold of pride. I don't deserve to be loved. That's a stronghold of rejection. I'll never recover. That's a stronghold of defeat. I must be good and perfect or God will reject me. That's the stronghold of performance and perfection. I'm only as good as I look is the stronghold of appearance. My value is equal to what I possess, what I own. That's the stronghold of materialism. Most Christians, most of us, we're we're easy to recognize others' strongholds, but the ones in ourselves, the ones in our lives, they're a little bit more difficult to discern. And as a result, most Christians, many of us, they live live in the shadow of these joy-sucking Jerichos, right on the cusp of the promised land, but never quite making it. But the good news is, is that my Bible tells me that we don't have to be among those people living in the shadows. Our weapons are from God above and have divine power to demolish strongholds. 
Isn't that what we want, though, really, truly? We long to see those strongholds demolished, turned into rubble once and for all, forever and ever. We long to see Jericho brought to the ground. So how does it happen? How do we do it? Well, it's very simple. We keep God in the center. The Ark of the Covenant, what was that the symbol of? It was a symbol of the Lord's presence, right? Yeah. And Joshua placed the Ark in the middle of the procession. Every activity, every decision orbited around God. We don't attack our Jericho with anger or blame casting or finger pointing. No, we keep God center stage using the weapons of worship and scripture and prayer. We employ every tool that God offers, hymns, songs, communion, scripture memorization and petitions. We turn off the TV, we put down our phones, and we open our Bibles more. We remember Jesus' promise, I am with you always. We worry less, we pray always, we even blast our own version of a ram's horn. Well, what's a ram's horn? Well, the Hebrews used two instruments. They used the silver trumpet, and they used the ram's horn. The silver trumpet was used to call people to assembly. The ram's horn celebrated a battle already won. When Abraham displayed his willingness to give up his son to sacrifice Isaac, God stopped him and provided a ram. The ram's horn reminds us of, of God's sovereignty, God's sovereign generosity. God gave Abraham a ram of deliverance. And God told Joshua to fill the air with the sound of the ram's horn victory. And strangely enough, he also told the people to keep quiet. No chit-chat, no small talk, don't say a word. No opinion giving, no second guessing. No whining and whispering. Keep your mouth shut and the trumpets loud. God is the result of this victory, not me, not you. Imagine the reaction of the Canaanites as Joshua's army is marching circles around them. First day, they probably got a kick out of it. Look at these Hebrew fools. Just walking around, not saying a word, blowing their trumpets. Did they not see us here? <laughs> blowing the trumpet of victory and no arrow has been fired. The second day, they were probably scoffing still, mocking somewhat, but they were probably doing it a little bit less loud. By the fourth and the fifth day, they're pretty quiet up there on those walls. They're looking at those people and they're saying, what in the name of all that is good and pure is going on down there? Now they're nervous. On the sixth day, the Canaanites were dry-mouthed and wide-eyed as the Hebrews made their round around the city. The people of Jericho had never fought a battle like this. They'd never seen an enemy act this way. Just as challenging as your battle with your arch enemy, the devil. He's held a stronghold in your life for years. You've tried everything to overcome it. Renewed discipline, self-help books, nothing helps. But now you come in God's power, with God, center stage. Jesus in your heart, angels front and back. You come not with hope of a possible victory, but with assurance of complete victory. March like a promised land conqueror, friends. Blast your ram's horn, sing your songs of redemption, and declare the scriptures of triumph. Marinate your mind with the declaration of Jesus. It is finished. Personalize those proclamations of Paul. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ Jesus. As you do, those demons in your life will begin to scatter. They have no choice but to leave. James 4, verse 7, I like how the message paraphrases it. It says, yell a loud no to the devil and watch him scamper. 
He will retreat. He must retreat. He is not allowed in the place where God is praised. Just keep praising and walking. But pastor, I've been walking a long time. Well, it seems like it, I'm sure, for some of us. It must have seemed that way to the Hebrews, too. Joshua didn't tell them how many trips that they would have to make around the city. God told Joshua that the walls would fall on the seventh day, but, but Joshua didn't tell the people. They just kept walking. Our Joshua didn't tell us either. Through the pen of Paul, Jesus urges us to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Friends, my prayer for you, my counsel to you, is keep walking. For all you know, this may be the day that the walls come down. You may only be steps away from a moment like this. On the seventh day, they rose early, about the dawning of the day, and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. And the seventh time it happened, when the priests blew the trumpets, that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened that when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat. Then the people took the city. The very walls that kept them out became stepping stones onto which they could climb. By the way, a great shaking is coming for this world too. Our Joshua, Jesus, he will give the signal and a trumpet will sound. He will reclaim every spoil and repel once and for all every demon. He will do again for us what he did in Canaan. Until that day, keep marching and believing. Defeat your strongholds with the spiritual weapons of worship, scripture, and prayer. Move from false premises to God's promises. It's just a matter of time before your Jericho comes tumbling down. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are grateful for the victory you have won for us. Lord, we know that the battle is not ours, but it is yours. We know that we are not warring against flesh and blood, and that this great controversy that is raging all around us will not end until you come back. And so, Lord, it is our prayer that you return soon. Lord, come back soon and save us from this world of darkness. In your name we pray. Amen.